grateful for this time to open up God's Word and to be led closer to Him and hopefully be led actually to Him if you're with us and are not a, a member of the Lord's Church or not a Christian or not following Jesus. We are so glad that you are with us. We're, we hope that you'll continue to come and, and uh, learn with us, uh, study the Bible with us. And uh, hopefully through this lesson we're going to see that certainly uh, there is only one true source of uh, confidence that we can have. And we're thankful that we've been given that through Christ. He's validated uh, his authenticity of being the sole source of authority. And we can know we're, we're going to be right with God if we follow him and follow his ways. So we hope we can have some things that will be helpful in that regard as we study more from the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And we'll start reading in verse 1. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 1. It says, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porticos. And these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first after the stirring up of the water stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day, so the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. And it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. I want to spend our time this morning focused on this one phrase that Jesus utters, uh, worthy of our attention, uh, a, a warning he gives to this man who had been healed by Jesus. And he actually says to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. A, a worthy admonition. We want to examine that here together. Uh, one of the first things that, that we notice about this statement is, is actually Jesus says this initially in contrast to one of the warnings that this man has already heard. In fact, this man has already heard this warning, stop sinning, uh, but not from Jesus. He heard it from somebody else. He hears it in verse 10. What is interesting is that when Jesus encounters this man, he's unable to walk. And we see his sad condition, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, un unable to really see any hope for it. He, he, he is desperately in need of, of getting to these waters that that are being stirred up by the angel, and anybody who can get in there can be healed of their affliction. And this man uh, just cannot seem to get ahead in life. Now, every time he tries to get in there, someone steps in ahead of him, and, and, he, and he kind of gives a sad, really, story of, of why that is. And Jesus sees him and says, well, what, do you want to get well? And he says, well, well, I, I can't. You know, every time I try, someone comes in before me, and nobody will help me. And, and Jesus heals him. He doesn't, he doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't need, he doesn't need uh, uh, someone to, to come and help him. He, 
he, that, that's really what, what we want to focus on is that we need to understand uh, Jesus has this soul authority and soul, all this power. And he helps him and he demonstrates that he has this power. And we want to focus on that, that we might be helped. Because in the religious world we live in, with all the confusion we have, uh, it's very similar to the situation this man is in. Notice he hears two warnings, one from one group and one from, from Jesus. And he's kind of in this tug of war between what to do about it. And, and we need to recognize to get to the source, we do have an issue with sin. That's the problem. Sin is a very serious matter. Sin is the reason why Jesus came. Sin is the reason why Jesus died on the cross. That alone should make us recognize it is within our, our, our good uh, interest to know about sin, to know about the sins that we've committed, to know why we've been separated from God through it and, and how we can get rid of it. Uh, Jesus has come for that very reason, for that very purpose, to get rid of that sin. And the sad thing is that even, even while he came to it and even afterwards, there's so much, some of that tug of war in the religious world. We have denominationalism. We have all kinds of sources so-called of authority telling people what to do about their sin. And the question remains, well, what are we going to do about it? Who, who can we trust? Who, can we, who, can, who should we listen to? And notice, it's interesting, when, when, G, when after Jesus heals the man, he sends him on his way, he tells him, pick up your pallet and walk. He simply does what Jesus told him to do. Uh, he, he trusts Jesus. Jesus is the one now who's changed his life. He's healed him. He's done something that nobody else was able to do. And notice in verse 9, it says, Immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet, and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath, and so notice the first warning he hears is from this group of people. They essentially tell him it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. In other words, they say, stop sinning. Really, this statement, stop sinning, first comes from them. They're warning him. You are in violation of this Sabbath ordinance. And you need to stop doing that because you are not permitted to do that on this day. And then so he really is in conflict here because he recognizes, well, wait a minute. Uh, it was the man who made me well uh, actually told me differently. Uh, and, and he mentions that and, and gives that for their consideration. But here, that's what he points to. He says there's kind of this, this tug of war here. You told me that I'm sinning. And Jesus actually told me it's okay to do it. It's kind of a dilemma that we still have faced with us today. But the, the sad thing is that the answer is very simple. And the man seems to be led by Jesus to understand that he is going to be in conflict and he's going to be, have to answer these questions. He's going to try to figure this out. But Jesus tries to make it very easy for us. And that's that's what I love about the gospel. That's what I love about Jesus. That's what I love about the power of what he's able to do for us. It is he makes it so easy for us if we just simply trust him, trust his word alone, trust his ways alone, and, and we can be led out of the religious confusion of the world. Perhaps maybe there are visitors with us here this morning. And maybe you have heard us maybe preach on things. Maybe you've heard others that you know. There are members here say things about your life or say things about what you need to do with your life. And maybe you are maybe in the same sense of a tug of war. Well, well I, I know other maybe good religious people have said, no, this is okay, it's, this is not a sin, or there's, there's no need to change this, or, or this is how you take care of your sin, this is how you remedy that. And maybe you're hearing other people having all kinds of different opinions about that. I want to help you with that and hopefully after, offer just a word of confirmation. Notice this man, this man is also in an in interesting dilemma, but Jesus makes it easy for him. You say, well, who has the power, who has the authority to direct us away from our sin? And, and it is obviously the one who has the demonstration of that. Jesus does. Jesus does. You know, and, and it is a, a good lesson for all of us, especially those who are in a position where maybe we've been uh, teaching Scripture or we're trying to lead people, trying to help people, that we can get a little too ahead of ourselves. We can have our own opinions. We can have our own biases. We can have our own maybe past experiences that maybe influences how we look at the text. And, and I need to be careful about that. We all need to be careful about that. And it's really a good lesson about this. It reminds me again of some of the early preaching that was done in the New Testament. It's very encouraging because of how humble a lot of those preachers and those apostles were about how they directed people. 
there, there always tend to be a tendency, obviously, to listen to somebody who seem to be in a position of authority, especially when it comes to Bible knowledge or, or religious matters. And, and that's the, the situation here. The, these people that, that had told them you were sinning were in a religious place of authority. It would have been very easy for them to exert that and kind of uh, encourage them based on uh, their so-called experiences or, or what they claimed that they knew or understood to use that. And, he's, and Jesus is challenging this man, saying, I want you to ver think very very cautiously. I want you to think about what it is you're going to do. And I'm telling you, it's okay to do this. Or I'm giving you permission. That some place is going to tell us it's wrong to do this where other people might give us permission. And we need, to be, we need to ask ourselves that very question, who are we going to listen to? And especially those of us who teach and preach, we need to make sure that we're encouraging those who hear our teaching to go to the source. That no matter what I say, no matter what you hear someone else say, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because there's only one source that really matters. And it is Jesus. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul himself. When he was speaking of audiences that would come and hear him preach, and here's, a, here's an individual who was given the power of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate, to validate everything that he was saying, that God was authenticating it, saying, this is heavenly, this is true, because no one else could do these signs. This is Jesus. But Paul also was what he was a man. He was a man capable of uh, making mistakes, being tempted, and he needed to recognize that he needed to follow the correct authority and point people to that authority. And Paul once said, he said, there were some individuals that he knew, and there were the Bereans. And he said, I like the attitude of the Bereans. Because even as they hear me preach, if they hear me preach on these things, they go back to the scriptures and double check and make sure that these things are so because there was the authority of God's word. And that's what we want to encourage. If you're here a visitor with us, I want, I want to encourage you. I know that you, there may be a little bit of bias in this statement, but I want to encourage you that, that there is, and I'm just speaking truthfully and honestly. I strongly encourage you to keep coming and, and associating yourself with this group of individuals because you will find that this is a group of people that are looking for the right source. We're trying to keep each other in check. In fact, I love some of you have heard some prayers that have been offered before preaching is done. And I like it because it's encouraging because we often pray for the individual to speak that he will remember the things he's about to say. He will be able to speak plainly so we can understand it. But you also catch this also wonderful aspect of those prayers you will hear brethren here say. Let us as listeners go to the scriptures and make sure the things that are being spoken are so. You won't hear that in a lot of places. A lot of places, whatever the preacher says goes. A lot of places, whoever is doing the teaching, that's, that's what goes. We are striving to follow the example that Jesus set here. That there is only one trusted source of authority. And it is the one who made this man well. And in many ways, as we come back to the statement, that's what Jesus is trying to encourage him to, 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 to continue to trust. And he finds himself in this awkward position of, of who do I listen to? What's right and what's wrong? I'm hearing two opposing views on this. Jesus here in verse 9, immediately uh, after hearing the word, pick up your pallet. He does so. He picks up the pallet. He doesn't even think about it. Picks up his pallet and goes and begins to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day. And here, those that were, that were trying to lead individuals and trying to make sure that they were correct in, in their observance of these, these Sabbath laws were trying to help them and said, so the Jews were saying to that man, wait a minute, it's the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But verse 11, but he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And I like what he says here. In other words, what he's essentially saying is, the one who showed greater authority is the one who told me to do this, and that's why I followed it. When he made me well, he proved, he demonstrated that this man certainly must be from God, and I certainly must be able to trust the things that he says can lead me to God. He validated that. He made sure that he recognized that it was, it was so. In other words, I, what I like about this is this is the one time in Scripture, or rather I've said the one time maybe it's appropriate for us to say the preacher told me to do it. 
This is the one time when it's appropriate to say it. When we know Jesus tells us to do it, yes, that's the only preacher that we can say, he told me to do it, and we should be able to trust that and follow that. We are infallible. Or we are, we are fallible. We, are, we make mistakes. But we need to be honest and humble about that as we studied in our Bible class this morning about Nebuchadnezzar. A man who thought too much of himself, was trusting too much in his own ways, and he was able to humble himself and say, wait a minute, God is the one who has the authority. And so we want to encourage anyone who's with us. If you're hearing us teach or preach, we want to encourage you. We're trying our best to do that. We want to encourage you to also search your Bibles, search the Scriptures, and make sure that we can trust the direction we're going is because God has validated it through the miraculous demonstration of Jesus. And He's going to tell us, number one, what is it that we need to do to change how can we change? And what is it that we need to stay away from? Now notice it's interesting. What he's essentially doing is he's leading him and reminding him and saying, remember, Jesus validated his authority by his power. And, and Jesus is going to remind him about this as we follow along in the text. Notice verse 11. And verse 11 says, But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away. And in verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. And what I love about this is here, Jesus again reminding him, and he recognizes he's probably been told some things, confused about some things, questioning some things. And let's listen to the statement. Je Jesus says, Behold, you have become well. You have become well. What is he insinuating about that? He's again reminding him, I know you've probably been challenged on what I told you to do. I, I know you've probably been questioning because now it sounds like what I just asked you to do, what I, what I told you is permissible to do. Now people are saying, well, was that right? Is that correct? And what Jesus did is he's reminding him, remember that you became well. Well, how did you become well? Was it, was it yourself? Was it some, some uh, well-meaning neighbor? No, you, you know, you know, it was me. I'm the one who made you well. Reminds us of what Jesus was trying to get at when we go back to Mark chapter 2. When there was the four men who lowered their friend down to Jesus to try to make sure that there was an opportunity for this man to become well. He was unable to walk. And remember, Jesus used the, the, the moment of healing to try to encourage people of who to trust when we need direction in our life. Because Jesus recognized when he came to the earth, there was all kinds of directions, all kinds of conflicting thoughts. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you have uh, the Herodians. You have all kinds of fractions of parties who claim that they were the experts in knowing what the law taught. And then you had Jesus, who kind of threw a big wrench in all of that, but what, he, what separated him from everybody else was he could do things that nobody could. And what he was trying to do is, I want to make it simple for the confusion. I want to try to make it so that we can have something to trust. He said, just go to the source. And that's what Jesus does here in Mark chapter 2. He says, well, if, if you know that I'm able to tell this man to get a walk, then you know I have the authority, I have the ability to forgive sin. Number one, what that tells us is that Jesus is the one to tell us how to go, what to turn from, and how we can fix it, and how we can have confidence that he is the one that we can go to for that answer. And we recognize that we can maybe be looked at as one of several different possibilities for people to go in their religious uh, answers in line. But we, we make the same plea that Paul did if let's simply just go to the Bible. And I'm encouraged by this group that we've been here together knowing that that's the attitude, is we want to know what God says. And we're trying to help each other understand what God says. And we're trying to help each other make sure that we have that confidence. And we want to encourage you that if you're looking for those answers, we're a, we're a group of individuals trying our best to just simply follow it the way that this man was instructed to follow it. Sort through all the confusion. And let's just go to the source. Let's let Jesus teach us, correct us, and let's seek to understand it as best we possibly can. And that's essentially what he was doing here when he made this statement at the healing of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2. This is what he's saying. He said, behold, you have become well. Who was it that made you well? 
I, I did. So let me, let me handle this dilemma for you. Is it right for you to pick up your paddle and walk? Well, who's the one who told you it was okay? Or who's the one who's telling you it's not okay? Well, that's how we handle that. Anytime there's that conflict of interest, anytime there's, there's opposing viewpoints, what we have to try to do is simply just let the Scriptures teach us. And let's be able to have that humility, as we see in Nebuchadnezzar also, to trust that Jesus knows and his word is final. We, we need to trust that and obey that. And we encourage anyone who's with us that you also would do so. But Jesus this does hit on this point. He says, you, you have become well. Do not sin anymore. This is the direction Jesus has for our life. Jesus recognizes how destructive, how harmful, and what the eternal consequence of sin is. Hence, notice the, the indication, lest something worse happen to you. Stop sinning. There's an eternal consequence for our sin. And it's not worth using any other method than simply trusting that the Lord who knows about our sin, the Lord who came to help us with our sin, and the Lord who came to forgive us and take that sin away, to trust the direction that he has for us. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. And one, one final point I want to make as we then are, make our, our final conclusion on how we can be assured that we are following Christ. If you're with us, if you're a asking those questions as well, that you maybe want to make sure that you have the confidence that you are going the right direction. But just consider this also, this other inference that he makes in this statement. He says, behold, you have become, well, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Well, we go back to the actual miracle itself, and what we find is that Jesus is making a mention that he already knows that this man has committed sin. In other words, he's saying, don't commit any further sin. This man is living in sin. This man has sins that have affected his life. Not only are there eternal consequences, but I'm led to believe by, by this statement in the context of it that essentially what Jesus is inferencing is the reason this man became injured or, 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 or was affected somehow was maybe through some sin indicating that Jesus has made him well Jesus has removed the, the implication the, the, the disorder of his life saying well I've healed you of that why commit the same things that brought you to that condition perhaps maybe it was such a, an egregious sin that that's why he doesn't have anybody to help him uh, some have suggested perhaps uh, the sin that he had been committing was uh, so uh, altering in his life not it did affect him but perhaps maybe others and, and that's why there's nobody that can come and help him but whatever the case is we do know that Jesus was aware that this man was a sinner when he came to help him and, and I just want us to think about that fact if anyone here is dealing with sin or here coming for answers for sin or seeking the Lord's help to turn you away from sin what I love about the Gospels, it teaches us that Jesus, when he comes to deal with our sin, he already knows all about it. He knows all the details. And he still yet wants to demonstrate that we should trust him because of his great concern and his love for us. In other words, what I love about this, when we go, go back to the initial interaction with, where Jesus meets this man, there we see in verse 6, John chapter 5 and verse 6 says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, notice what it says, it says he knew that he already had been a long time. He knew all about it. He said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. What I love about this is Jesus deals with this problem before he ever even addresses him, correcting any other additional sins in his life. In other words, the compassion of Jesus. In other words, the gentleness of Jesus. In other words, knowing our condition, Jesus wants us to be in a state where we trust him for him to deal with our sin. We have to let him do that work of forgiving us of our sin, cleansing us of our sin, and then teaching us to further stay away from sin. But in all that process, what I love about this is that Jesus wants us to be comfortable in his presence so that we can let him lead us in that way. Which is not a kind of standoffish thing of, uh, of being uh, 
embarrassed by us or, or being uh, too good for us. In so many ways, he's shown himself to be the ultimate servant to those who are in sin. That we might realize he wants to help us. He wants to save us. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to leave us far, far away from our sin. And what part of the biggest reason why we encourage individuals to simply go to Jesus because he has that authority to do that. He has the desire to do it. And he's also made it very simple. Not only has Jesus made it simple to know how we can understand what sin is, but he's also made it simple for us to understand how we can remove it. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. And I've always thought this to be maybe perhaps one of the most uh, simplest, easy examples to follow when asking the question, well, now that I realize what sin is, and now that I realize I have it, now that I realize I'm in danger, what do I do to get rid of it? Let's read Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36, there was preaching about individuals who had turned against Jesus, and they had actually had been complicit in him being nailed to the cross. And in verse 36, this apostle, this preacher sums up his lesson saying that they essentially had put to death Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, verse 36, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Peter made it very simple. And what we'll find is the things that Peter said, you can actually find Jesus said them. The things Peter told them, instructed them to do were the exact same things Jesus instructed his own apostles to teach and to preach. And what we find is that there was still this controversy even after this day. There was all kinds of, again, that same tug of war. Well, well, well the Christians and, and the apostles and the teachers are telling people to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And then others were coming along and saying, well, no, there's something else you have to do. There's something else beyond baptism that you also have to do. And we live in that same spiritual condition today, unfortunately. So many people have so many different ways that answers the problem of sin. And ultimately, what we appeal is that we just simply follow the Lord who has the authority to cleanse. He demonstrated by being risen from the dead. If you're with us and you have never obeyed the gospel, by obeying the gospel, simply mean obey what was preached here in Pentecost. Repented of your sins, were buried in water for forgiveness of your sins, and walked in newness of life. We encourage you to trust the source. The one who was put to death, who was buried and risen again, has that authority to teach us, to lead us, and wants to cleanse us and forgive us of our sin. We also have further instruction that if we confess our sins, that if we turn away from our sins, we have the amazing access of that forgiveness aspect of Christ, that he will continually offer that forgiveness, even when we continue to stumble in sin. And so if anyone has disobeyed, has gone back into sin, we have a way for us to come back to him, confess and repent, make it right. Whatever the case may be, we encourage you. Let us appeal to the Lord, and we invite you to, to join in us as we all want to be pleasing to God and have that final confirmation that we've done what is right and we will be pleasing to Him, turning away from sin and turning to the holy God who loves us. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to simply follow the simple instructions that Jesus has provided for us to become a Christian, be baptized in water for forgiveness of your sins. Won't you come to the front? We would assist and help you while we stand and sing this song of encouragement.